Hi, I'm Jo Grace. I run the Sensory Projects. The Sensory Projects all run on the principle that you don't need expensive bits of kit to do effective sensory work. You just need the right knowledge and a little bit of creativity. And I've been asked to tell you about some of the courses I run. And I'm actually running more courses in 2019 than I have done before. So there's some new ones. And I'm going to start with the most unusual of them, which is called Exploring the Impact of Your Senses on Behaviour. And it does what it says on the tin. It's aimed unusually for one of my courses, not at people who are supporting children with complex needs, but at those of you who support children whose behaviour is sometimes triggered by their experience of the sensory world. So that's children who have big explosive behaviours like biting and kicking and throwing stuff, or children who just struggle day to day with the kind of niggly difficulties of the sensory world. And the course is very practical. It will look at the roots that underpin that link between the senses and behaviour and give you the chance to develop some simple strategies that you can use to support those children. So that's the, that's the surprising one. The more predictable ones are, of course, I'm going to be running the Ambitious and Inclusive Sensory Storytelling Day. Now, I know all of you tell sensory stories already. This day isn't to teach you to suck eggs. It's to give you insight into how to create a really great sensory story and also how narrative can be used as a tool for inclusion, how it permeates our lives and affects our relationships and our connection with society and just all sorts of things like that. So it really is an ambitious day. Um, two of the other new days that I run are a kind of pair. One is Sensory Engagement for Sensory Beings, a beginner's guide, and the other one is the Counterintuitive Sensory Course. And these are essentially a beginner's guide to teaching students with complex needs and a, a, those of you who are a more experienced course. So it's if you have been working with students with PMLD for sort of one, two, three years, then the beginner's guide option is probably the one for you. It's going to be the opportunity to network with people who are in a similar position with you and to ask the questions that you might feel silly about asking or just check the knowledge that you've gained so far and develop some good, strong strategies for using sensory engagement techniques in a structured way and in a playful way. And the counterintuitive sensory course is for those people who have had more experience of working with students with PMLD. And it's quite likely that if you are among those people, you haven't had a lot of opportunity to go on training days that are relevant to you. You will be the people who are super good at cherry picking from other days, finding things that are right for your learners. And I, my main aim with this day is to not teach you to suck eggs. I know that you know it already and you've probably got way more experience than me. My challenge for this day is to get a group of you together and to see what we can get from you all when we put our heads together and when I teach you a little, a few little creative strategies. So for example, we will be putting you in the Large Hadron Collider of ideas and seeing what you come up with. So it's going to be another good day for networking. I will challenge you with some insights from the latest research and see what you think about that, but I definitely will not be teaching you to sack exits. It's a, a chance to explore some of the more counterintuitive notions around sensory engagement. And then the two days that are really my babies, the, these days are the reason that I started doing um, ticketed events myself. Generally, I'm out and about doing inset days for people like yourselves, but the ticket events these two days are the reason that I do them. Uh, the first is the Develop Your Sensory Lexicon Recourse, which is a bit of a confusing title, I appreciate, but essentially a lexicon is a, 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 a branch of knowledge or a vocabulary, and this is a vocabulary of the senses, and the develop bit refers to the development of the sense. So each of your senses has a development that it runs through. There are things that you can respond to in early development and there are things that you respond to later on. And knowing that development of a sense is essential if you're supporting learners with cortical sensory impairments, but it's also really useful for a whole load of other learners. So it's things like, um, if you imagine it as a curriculum, you know, if I was going to teach you maths, I could put all the maths I know up on the wall and go, there's maths. And most of you would look at that and conclude that maths is not for you. If I want you to learn maths, I will start you off with experiences of one and many. 
and then I will take you on to counting and then I'll take you to adding and we'll step through it like that. And you're far much more likely to be able to understand all the maths on the board if I take you through it in those steps. Now for our students who have cortical sensory impairments, being shown, for example, if you have a cortical visual impairment, being shown the whole visual world is the same as being shown all the maths on the board. You don't stand a chance of understanding it. And if I can take you through the visual equivalent of one and many and the visual equivalent of counting, then I can support you in developing your capacity to understand the information that you receive through your sense of sight. So for your cortically impaired students, it's just essential for supporting their development. But actually, it's also really interesting for a lot of other students as well. So for example, if you have children who have degenerative conditions, they will tend to track back through their sensory abilities in order. And so as they lose their capacity, you need to know what the next thing is that they're going to be able to engage with in order to maintain that connection between yourselves and the student and also between the student and their learning. For children who have um, high levels of anxiety, these early developmental sensory experiences can be really supportive in helping them to feel safe and secure in their environment. Because these senses, sensory experiences are the first ones that get wired through the brain. These are the easiest ones for the brain to access stimulation through. So in essence they're the mental equivalent of television. The brain just has to lie there and do nothing and it gets stimulation. So they are really calming and so if you're supporting children who have quite high levels of anxiety, for example, a lot of your students with autism are likely to be in this category, then offering them environments that are rich in early developmental sensory experiences or offering them early developmental sensory experiences to help them calm can be a really lovely way of supporting them in engaging in their learning and feeling safe when they're at school and connecting with you. And also these early developmental ones are a lot to do with attachment and bonding in early life. So again, if you're supporting students who have attachment disorders, they're a really interesting one to look at. And the other group that it's interesting to consider them for is students who have a sensory processing disorder. Now, uh, those of you who've seen me speak before will know that I'm a big research geek and so pretty much everything that I tell you on any of the training days will have a foundation in research somewhere. Um, I have personal experience and professional experience of the world that we work in but I like to back that up with good research knowledge and so sensory processing disorder is a bit of an interesting one in that it has become a kind of fad diagnosis in recent times, a bit like ADHD was in the early 90s and because of that um, popularity of the condition it gets misunderstood and it gets missupported and, and a lot of people make a lot of money from it. So just because it is a popular diagnosis doesn't mean it's not a real thing. They did the research in 2009 that showed a physiological difference in the brains of people who have sensory processing disorder. In essence, your senses have volume controls on them and theirs are broken or set wrong. So if you have a sensory processing disorder and you have that physical disability in your brain such that your sense of sight is set to process too highly, then the early developmental sight experiences are likely to be the ones that come through strongest and the ones that you struggle with most. So for you, I might look to offer you some of the later developmental sensory experiences. However, I think, and this is me speculating now, this is not based in research, but you can reflect on this yourselves and see what you think. I think were you to take the children who are currently identified as having sensory needs and look in their brains for that physical difference, I think you would find a tiny fraction of them have it. I think what's happened for the rest of the children is that they've had a different experience of early sensory development to the one that you and I might have shared. So for example, for some things it's really easy to see how an early developmental experience underpins your later abilities in school. For example, mark making clearly becomes writing. But it's things like rolling down a grassy bank becomes the ability to sit still in class. And if you've had an early childhood rich in these sensory experiences, then your capacity to interact with the world and to engage and focus will be fully formed. 
But if you've missed out on some, for example, if you had a childhood that was had a lot of screen time in it, and I'm not against screen time, our students learn awesome things from technology, but it's just, it substitutes, you know, if you spent all that time on a gadget, you haven't spent that time rolling down grassy hills and playing in the mud. And so you might miss out on some of those experiences that you need in order to develop your sensory processing. And it's like, you know, going back to my maths analogy, it's as if you have a child who never learned to add up. When they're further along in their mathematical skills, sometimes it's going to work fine and sometimes it's going to be completely out of whack. And for those children, what I would look to do is exactly the same as I would look to do with that child who's missed out on adding. I take them back to the start and go, OK, do you understand one and many? Do you understand counting? Have you got adding? Oh, you need to practice a bit more on adding. Let's do a bit more of that. And then I'd step them up and I would expect you to become somebody who can do their maths just fine. So for those children whose sensory difficulties are maybe not because of that physical disability, it's really useful to know that development of the sense that you can give them the opportunity to go back and practice and rehearse those skills and just make sure those foundations are properly laid before you're asking them to process all this sensory information. So on the Develop Your Sensory Lexicon Week course, I teach you the development of seven sensory systems. I run seven systems on the projects for purely pragmatic reasons. Um, if you want to be technical about it, you have 33 sets of neurons that control your senses. So arguably you've got 33 senses, but I couldn't possibly fit them into a day. Uh, I do do a, a super sensory lexicon, which is a two-day version of the Develop Your Sensory Lexicon course, where we have nine senses and all sorts of other extra stuff. And next year it's going to run in Brighton, right on the seafront next to the Pleasure Pier, on a Thursday and Friday. So you just need to book the Thursday and Friday and then the weekend in the hotel and you'll have a lovely um, long break, as well as a really useful training course. Uh, the final... One that I want to tell you about is this one actually, although the lexicony is my baby and I tour the lexicony around the country because I think it's such important knowledge, this course is the course that is the reason that I do my own training days. Um, and you have to understand that I, um, I love doing training days, but my skill set is in reading the research, coming up with the creative practice, communicating it to you. It is not in organising your lunch, um, working out how you get to a venue, booking a venue. Uh, one of the um, training days that I ran this year, I accidentally booked a nightclub as the venue. But don't, don't be put off. I am learning. But the reason that I do them is not because I have fantastic talents as an event host. It's not that I make more money you know, from doing them myself. I make about the same money as I would do if you booked me to do an in-house training day. The reason that I run my own events is because I think this information is important. It's because I've met lots of people who are dealing with sensory behaviour in their schools but don't understand what it is. And so I've got the Explore the Impact of the Senses on Behaviour Day. I've met loads of people who support individuals with PMLD who haven't had training on how to engage their students. And so they're in that beginning first couple of years of going, what do I do? And I must be the only person in the world who's like this. So you've got the sensory engagement for beginners guide. I meet people who have been in their settings for 20 years, 35 years, who did some relevant training a long time ago, but there's nothing new for them. So you have that counterintuitive sensory course. And that information about the development of the senses, I think that's so useful. So you have the development of the sensory, the develop your sensory lexicon course. But this course, Sensory Engagement for Mental Wellbeing, is actually the course that made me run my own events in the first place. And that was set up because through the running of the sensory projects, so there's been three projects so far, the Sensory Stories project, the Art project, the Sensory Being project, there's a fourth project running currently, the Seismic Sensory project, and there's a fifth one due to run next summer. Every time I've done one of those projects, I've done a literature review, and I've read all the research that I can lay my hands on into sensory stuff and into the lived experience of people with profound disabilities, and I live in rural Cornwall, I catch a lot of trains, I do two or three, seven or eight hour train journeys a week, so I have plenty of time for reading this research. And every time I do a big literature review, what I find in that is a message that says, this is a population of people 
who have very high mental health care needs and no one is doing anything about it. And I first read that loud and clear in 2012, 2013, and then I read it again in 2014, and then I read it again and again. And there's only so long that you can read it and not do anything about it and still, you know, sleep at night. So I was thinking, what is it that I can do? And this is the bit that I can do. But there's, you know, we all need to be doing our bit. And to just give you a brief insight, in the general population, about 10% of us are mentally unwell at any one time. And that's not a specific 10%, that's a shifting 10%, you know, just like 10% of us might have a headache or a stomach upset. In the learning disabled population, that statistic rises to 40%, which is horrific. And the research shows that the more disabled you are, the more at risk you are of having a mental health problem. And in one of the studies I read, the rate for students with profound and multiple learning disabilities was over 80%. So if you work in a special school, I'm not suggesting to you that you might support students who have mental health problems. I'm telling you that you do. And so the Sensory Engagement for Mental Wellbeing Day looks at what what that research says, you know, where have those risks come from? And then it just is, essentially it's a list of little sensory strategies that you can use every day to support mental health because your responsibility for mental health in school is the same as your responsible responsibility for physical health. You know, you should not be being asked to treat mental ill health. You are responsible for maintaining, men, mental, maintaining mental health. So it's things like, you would do healthy snacks. It's the sensory equivalent of eating an apple instead of a bag of crisps or taking the stairs instead of taking the elevator. These are the sensory strategies that used repeatedly through a school day will support mental health for your most complexly disabled learners. And we also develop strategies to support your own mental health and the mental health, as well as the mental health of your students. So it, I think it's such an important day your students who have those very profound physical disabilities, you look at them and you see their physical health needs so clearly. And in fact, their mental health needs are probably on a par with their physical health needs. So we need to be doing something about it. And this is the thing that I can do about it. So thanks for listening to me. If you want to find out more information about any of the events that I run, have a look on my website, which is just www.thesensoryprojects.co.uk or you can search Eventbrite for the individual, you know, if you want to buy a ticket to any of those things, or feel free to drop me an email to ask me more questions about them and come and find me online. Thank you very much for listening to me.